Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got a super interesting knife review slash knife overview to show with you guys. This is the Serge Penchenko and Hawk Rook. Absolutely one of the most unique knives that I have ever reviewed and not just because of the profile but because of the locking mechanism and you know if you're not familiar with Serge Penchenko and or Hawk knives, um, then you're about to learn about uh, some people in the knife world that um, have already had an enormous impact. And when they do something, it's unique. When they do something, it's special. Um, they have collaborated in the past, in fact, many times. And every time they have done so, it's been this major impact. Um, and uh, this is uh, this is more of that. In fact, um, I think this is maybe, should I say it's my favorite? I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I'm a huge fan of this knife. It is so cool. Thank you so much to uh, Serge uh, for uh, sending these in for me to take a look at. The titanium one is mine. The Ultim one here actually belongs to Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast, and he was kind enough to let me use it to showcase, um, you know, the the uh, lock and the detent system, which is unique on this knife. I think you guys will really enjoy taking a look at it. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. I need everybody to know that this is considered a custom knife. These are small batch and they are made in the United States. So do not expect this to be available in the same quantity as a typical Chinese production knife made out of 20 CV and titanium. It's just not going to be that way. It's also going to be very, very expensive. Serge is doing these one at a time in his own personal shop. So he cannot stock thousands of these things. And it's not a matter of, you know, why can't he just make more? Um, I, I think that's kind of an unrealistic expectation. So, you know, don't, don't go and harass anybody and demand that they make more just for you. Um, I'm certain that, uh, you know, Serge is going to make as many as he possibly can. Um, and if more are planned to be available, then you will find out by checking his website, following him on Instagram, right? Serge Panchenko or Serge Knives. Um, so that would be a, a good idea. Let's go ahead and get a measurement. I'm going to move mine out of the way, and we're going to use the Ultim one here to get a measurement. Uh, overall length of the Rook is coming in at about 7 inches, which is crazy. This knife is, you know, if somebody told me, like, oh, it's a 7-inch knife, I'd be like, hey, so, you know, it's something small. This knife has so much personality and so much presence that it truly, truly feels substantially larger. It's This is a mental thing. And it's proof that the design, right, when it comes down to length, obviously, if you made a one-inch knife, a one-inch knife is a one-inch knife. But there's this huge variation in overall size where, you know, how it's perceived uh, or if you're, if, you, if you're not given the visuals, if you're just given the measurements, like your, your idea of the size of it. This knife just is so huge to me. It's massive because it's, <laughs> it just screams originality, right? Um, but anyways, we have a seven inch knife and we have a three inch blade roughly. You could measure it at three and an eighth if you go all the way to the bottom. The cutting edge comes in at about, it's like 2.8. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and the Ontario Rat Model 2. It's definitely a lot closer to the size of the Rat 2, but it's got a little more height to it. Um, how about up against the Demco AD 20.5? Definitely uh, just a little bit shorter there. How about up against the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Para 3? There we go. Uh, more Para 3 sized for sure. And then last but not least, let's put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue and the Benchmade Bugout. How is the action on this knife? Oh, I know so many of you. We're waiting for this part. <laughs> oh boy, guys! Whoops, terrible there. Um, let me just let me just shut up for a second. What is going on with this knife? So we have um, the lock and the uh, toggle detent, which you can actually see right here, thanks to the Ultim. Oh boy. There's actually a uh, a coil spring in here, 
And there's also a coil spring here. A lot of people think that this is a crossbar lock with Omega Springs. No, no. In fact, it is unique to anything on the market. That's just the case, right? Hawk knives, and especially when they combine with Serge Penchenko, what, what churns out the other end is something that just isn't done. It's not, it can't be replicated, right? Um, I also really, really love stuff like this, right? And this is really going to pour salt into the wounds of some people. There are, there are people on this planet who still buy clones. I know, cringe, right? Um, I'm, I'm very anti-clone, so I'm going to be very unapologetic uh, to that. And that's fine. You can argue with me as much as you want. Um, but it's like standing on railroad tracks with a wiffle bat. You can do absolutely nothing to change my opinions on it. Um, I love knives like this because they just can't be cloned, right? As much as people say, oh, just wait, just wait. Yeah, well, we still don't have clone deadlocks, do we? We still don't have... Uh, clone orbits, do we? We don't have them because these are <laughs> very, very locked down and very difficult to reproduce. Hawk goes out of their way uh, to make sure that these are insanely difficult to replicate, and I, um, I just love that. Uh, I think that's great, um, and that adds uh, pride of ownership. Uh, and even if by you know some weird miracle somebody managed to make some kind of copy of it. It would just be so sloppy and terrible. It would never be the real thing. And uh, as a collector, and you know, my fellow collectors and fellow uh, knife enthusiasts who chase stuff like that, like this down, and they, you know, sometimes wait years to get unique pieces like this. Uh, we're all celebrating because it's it's something that can truly be cherished. It truly is unique, right? Not to say that any clone of anything else is actually successful in being exactly the same thing. It never will be. The original is always the, the original. Even if the clone is an exact one-to-one -one duplicate, it's still not the original. And people who buy clones eventually come to this realization. I've mentioned this many, many times. Uh, we're getting off on a tangent here. But people who buy clones inevitably, sometimes it takes them longer than other, other people, but they all inevitably arrive at the same conclusion. For a while, they justified in their heads, right? Um, you know, the clone's the same thing. Why am I going to spend so much more money? But eventually, the fact that it's not actually the original eats away at them. And then all the money that they ended up spending on all the clones could have been bought, you know, could have been used to buy something original. And eventually, they end up, you know, buying something original, right? Um, so... In, in a way, you know, clones are, for some people, actually a gateway into, you know, the true holy land, right? Um, so I, I guess in that sense, you know, you could say, you know, if people didn't discover clones, they may never have made it to that uh, that knife holy land, right? Um, but either way, that is the – if you're, if you're in the clone phase, just know that the inevitable fate is that you will – Forever, it will forever eat away at you that it is not the real thing, right? Um, that's just that's just part of the journey for some people, right? Go on your own journey. That's perfectly fine. Not coming down on anybody. I hate clones, but, you know, what are you going to do? These just, you're not going to see clones of them out there, right? It's the original or it's nothing, and I think that's great. The action, as we started to talk about a couple of minutes ago, is unlike anything else that I have ever experienced. The break of this toggle detent is unlike anything else because it is there is there literally isn't anything else like it. The breakaway happens here as that toggle detent sort of pushes in on itself and then clicks over, right? It approaches that event horizon and then slips over. This spring sort of creates tension and then slips that way the first chance that it gets. And it is so clicky. This area right here. Not only is it satisfying to push back into place, but it is amazing to deploy. This right here, this has got another coil spring, like right in this area right here, pushing back up. So you can uh, obviously use this little horn here, this little who horn. <laughs> it kind of, they remind me, it reminds me of a, the tip of like a who from Whoville, right? You use it to flip it, it's perfectly rounded, it's perfectly positioned. The strength of this toggle detent is perfect, and obviously pulling down on this area, it's only on one side, pulling down on this area to whip the knife closed um, is just wonderful. There's so many clicks. I think there's actually three clicks per deployment and disengagement, and it is wonderful. The lock, and you know, because it is a hawk lock, has zero blade play and is ridiculously strong. If you are not familiar with hawk knives, uh, you owe it to yourself as somebody who is interested in knives in general to research them. 
Um, they have created not only some of the most unique locking systems on Earth, but some of the strongest locking systems on Earth. And this is no exception. This is really, really cool. And I'm a huge fan of it. I, I really, you know, for a unique design like this, sometimes there's a trade off. Sometimes it's like, well, you can have the unique profile. You can have the, you know, unique fancy locking system, but you're going to have to trade for comfort or convenience or, you know, ease of manipulation, something like that. No, there's not. Uh, you, you, some people might not like the profile, but as far as how it functions, it's, it's, this is flawless execution. This is the stuff that knife people live for. Hawk knives, Grant and Gavin Hawk and Serge Penchenko are knife kings. They are legendary figures in the knife world. They are deeply woven into this community, right? They've been here longer than, than I would say most. So, when they collaborate to create something, it's going to come together in a way that is special. And this is special. I knew it was going to be from the moment I first saw it. And I'm just so happy getting it in hand that it really is that special knife that sort of ignites that fire. Uh, the knife enthusiast fire in me. <laughs> what a weird channel, right? People who are here for the first time. Who is this guy? Oh, man. Been here for a while. Not as long as Hawk and and uh, and Surge, but for a bit now. Let's go ahead and do carry profile. Uh, thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3. You know, uh, the liners, the titanium liners are pretty heavy duty. And then you have the scales on top. So it is going to be thicker than something like the Para 3. But not in a way that will, you know, bother you. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3. Um, it's about as long as the Para 3, and even at maximum height, it's still not quite, because the flipper tab's not down here, it's up here, right, the hoo horn. Um, so yeah, really, uh, in and out of the pocket, it's pretty easy. I mean, if you're going to carry a knife like this, which I know many, many people will, it's expensive. This is a custom knife, right? Um, but many people will carry and use this knife. It's, it's really pretty easy in and out of the pocket. Let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'm going to get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. I'm going to respect that Levon hasn't actually had a chance to handle his new knife yet. So if I'm going to touch my tools to a knife, I should probably, um, you know, do it on mine, right, and not his. This is a T8 pivot, and then we have T6 screws everywhere else which is, you know, whatever. It's fine. Um, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not going to get in here and take this apart, but taking a look at the internals, I don't think it'll be that complicated other than getting things. If you've ever worked with coil springs in a knife, you know that taking uh, <laughs> taking the scale off, it, it's a good idea to have it covered with a piece of Tupperware. So that if that spring comes out, it doesn't fly across the room. That actually happened to me with the 80, 20.5, despite people having warned me prior saying, hey, that spring's going to fly out of there. And I went, bah, I know what I'm doing, right? The way that the vast majority of us do. Yeah, it flew across the room, took me an hour and a half to find. I, I will never forget that. It took an hour and a half to find that screw or that, that spring. I almost gave up on it. Um, I'm not going to take either of these apart. I, I don't feel like I need to. Um, it doesn't look like it's anything overly complicated, but you will be working with coil springs, meaning things will need to be compressed and pushed into place and held down while you screw things back together. If you have one of these, I would recommend you leave it alone because it was made by Hawk and Surge. It was designed by Hawk and um, actually machined by Surge, which we're going to talk about that. But they... It's going to be fine the way that it is initially, right? There's probably not a great reason to have to get in there. And there's really not much of a way for debris to get into this area anyway. It's very, very closed off from pretty much everywhere except for way in here. I mean, it would the, the debris would have to take quite the journey to get into where you would need to clean it out. So I wouldn't, right? If you have one of these and you've been using it and for some reason it becomes inoperable, that's very unlikely, I would contact Surge and, uh, you know, because you spent a lot of money on it and I would say, hey, here's what's going on. That would be the best way to do it. But if you need to take it apart, I don't think disassembling it will be the issue. I think if there are any issues, it will be reassembling it. So anyways, let's go ahead and uh, measure blade stock thickness here real quick. Once again, I'm going to do that with mine. Um, I'm going to say that looks like about 125 to 130. Let's find out. 
Um, I'm almost exactly right for once. It looks like 129 thousands on the blade, so just about the middle of the road for the knife world. Let's go ahead and um, talk about these things. I think um, right off the bat, we should talk about where these, you know, who's making them and how they're being made. These are being machined one at a time by Serge Penchenko, right, in the USA. One at a time. Um, these are not, you know, just being like, it's not an assembly line. This is not a Chinese factory, right? Um, and that's that, that I, the idea of that being the case, right, is that that's the foundation people use when they determine what the thing should be priced at. That and people like to reduce things to the materials used. Um, now, this, this takes a little bit to get out of this mentality because that is not how things work. You cannot reduce – you can't assume that everything is being stamped and pressed on an assembly line and you also cannot assume that pricing – it directly correlates to the materials and the materials have a static value and there's no variables. That's wrong. That's very, very oversimplified and it's incorrect. Everybody kind of goes through that for a little bit in your knife journey. You kind of like get stuck there and then you get really frustrated with the pricing of things. And that's either when people quit and then they continue to you know, think the same thing. They, they quit their knife journey and they just think like this is the way that it is and yet they just never learn or they continue on and eventually they learn, ah, I see. CPM 20 CV is, you know, can take many, many forms and the amount of effort it takes to take that material and turn it into a blade, right, is widely varying and where that's done also changes the pricing, right? All of this. So when we're talking about a knife like this, which does have machine elements, but again, they're being made one at a time, small batch by, as far as I understand, one person, right? This is why they're so expensive, right? What I'm trying to do is, is cushion this blow for people who don't understand this yet. These are not cheap. Um, they're also, in, you know, the demand is massive for them. So, um, you know, regardless of what you think about the price tag, they're, they're gone pretty much the moment they're available. And I mean like the moment, like within seconds. I think that's how these went. Titanium, the least expensive variants are $1,000, right? This is mine. Uh, I was more than happy to purchase this knife. More than happy. As a collector enthusiast, this was a must own for me. Absolutely. Carbon fiber goes up to $1,200. Ultim is curiously $1,300. I think, you know... Part of the draw there is, um, number one, the Ultima is machined beautifully. These are actually contoured and it has like a cross hatch pattern, which I got, I would have died for on the titanium, but I understand that's a lot harder to do. To contour and cross hatch texture titanium, that would have been, <laughs> that would have been pretty difficult, right? Um, it's not the same process as doing this with Ultim. Now, a lot of people like to reduce Ultim to just plastic. Not true. Ultim is unbelievably durable and it is absolutely not the same thing as plastic that you would find on a Mattel toy. No. Um, it does just, as far as I know, it just comes in yellow, which, um, okay, fine if you like yellow. Uh, the benefit here is that we can actually see inside of the knife and see what's going on, which is really cool. And I think that's what makes the Ultim versions of this so sought after because they, I would, I would say they are probably the most popular. I, I, don't, I don't know why Ultim has to be yellow. I, I, I wish that there was a way to dye. I mean, a lot of people are like, just writ dye it. Uh, okay, yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't like solve the translucence thing. <laughs> it just dyes the out. You're only going to be dying the outside of it, and I would imagine that you're going to cloud up that translucence, right? So dying... Ultim doesn't solve the problem. I, I, you know, it would be really cool if it could come in different colors. I don't know exactly. I mean, I have, uh, you know, I imagine the color is the the end result of the process in making it, and so altering that would alter what it is, right? But let me tell you, if Ultim came in blue and red and green, as vibrant as it is on this uh, goldish yellow here. Oh my God, I would have it on everything. I think Ultim looks awesome and it is actually extremely durable, right? That'd be really cool. But as far as I know, Ultim only comes in uh, yellow. So that's what we've got there. Copper and silver Manuki, I don't know what that is. Those are priced at $1,500 and then any fancy stuff he has listed as $1,500 plus. So that suggests that there will be 
there currently are and will maybe will be more you know fancy versions in the future right he may have some other variations of this that come down the pipeline but there there is an end to this this is not a the you know these types of collaborations are not endless runs so there will be a certain amount of time that these are available and then we will all be banished to the secondary market to pick these up that's how it is now that's how it was 20 years ago right it's just that's normal uh, that's i mean the, the, he moves on and has other projects right now, you know, if he had like a, um, you know, multi-hundred person workforce, you know, if he was the size of CRKT, Spyderco, right, um, then uh, sure. But that's not the case, right? So we, we have to accept that these are the parameters of, of this, you know, this knife here. Moving on, let's take a look at the um, meat and potatoes here. Um, he told me that the reasoning for this cutout here, because it looks like a cutout for access to like a lock, <laughs> the reason for it is just the index finger comfort, right? And as oddly shaped as this, as this knife is, it is so bizarrely satisfying to hold. I will I will admit, I'm jealous of this uh, version that Levon has because it's just a little bit more comfortable. The contouring of the Ultim and the texturing of the Ultim really make this nice. Um, I don't know which versions are textured and, and contoured and which aren't, but I, I think these are some of the best versions uh, for sure. The rest of this is sort of an apocalyptic, you know, heavy stone wash. And I think it looks nice. Uh, it looks cool for the type of knife that this is. You can see that the these outer, well, it's just one, actually. This is the stop right here. And it's the open position stop. And, yeah, it's also the closed position stop, too. The jimping, I think, complements the choked up position really, really well. This area looks like it might be made for your thumb. Uh, it's not really comfortable for your thumb. I think it's honestly just an aesthetic dip, right? Because it would otherwise just be, I don't know, I think it would be less interesting, right? We have this fuller that curves and runs along, uh, you know, this part of the blade. This area up here, I think, boy, you know what? I think it might actually be tapering. It's really hard to tell. If this part up here is not a flat and it is tapering, it's very subtle. I think that's the case. It feels like a much more dramatic drop off right here. So this area is a flat and then this is flat ground starting here down to the edge. So it does come down to an okay edge. I mean, it's not unbelievably thin, but will it slice? Will it cut? Let me demonstrate here real quick. Just the factory edge on a piece of paper so you guys can see. The answer is yes, it absolutely will, right? Don't let anybody tell you that it won't. It's pretty uh, ready to cut there for sure. Uh, this is a surge cleaver, and when I say that, I, I make sure and say surge cleaver because a surge cleaver is very different than just a cleaver. Um, we went through a phase in the knife world where it was like cleavers, cleavers everywhere, everything's a cleaver, right? And it was just a, a cleaver. Surge has been doing the cleaver for a long time, but his cleavers are different. His cleavers are like distinctly surge. Um, and so I don't consider them a part of any fad. They are stuck out of time. It's, it's almost like a space temple where it's just Surge sitting on a throne. But the throne is it's kind of like the Game of Thrones throne, except it's made out of cleavers. <laughs> it's just, he's doing his own thing there. He's not subject to any other fads or anything. It's just, he's doing his own thing. And I like, you can always tell it's a surge cleaver, right? The, the down, downside to the uh, blades like this is that you don't have a, a super, you know, pronounced tip. You have a little bit of a tip. You can still dig into packages and things, but just, this isn't much of a puncture blade. It's more of a slicing blade, right? Very strong, though. You will not break it. CPM 20 CV, we can rest assured that this has been heat treated properly. Is it the right steel for this geometry? I don't know. Uh, it's fine. It'll work, right? I don't know that I really had much of a preference. I mean, had he done these in CPM 154, I'd have been like, hey, that sounds great. Had he done them in Magna Cut, I would say, hey, that sounds great. LMAX, sure. Vanax, why not, right? I mean, there's a number of different steels because... It, I, at this tier with this knife, I don't really care, to be honest with you, as long as it's not something like 8CR 13 MOV. If you have some type of premium steel on here and we have a reasonable cutting geometry, I'm, I'm going to be okay with it. At this tier, what I'm looking for is not the materials necessarily. That's part of the equation. But the bigger part of the equation is what is it that makes this special? How is it made? What is the, what's, the, what's the meat behind it? I want to know, right? You put the vegetables off to the side for a second. I want the meat, right? How's the meat cooked? Better be medium rare. Um, 
yeah, the titanium version is definitely heavier. Absolutely. And while these have been milled out for weight reduction, which by the way, we didn't actually weigh them. I should have done that. Sorry about that. I knew we were missing something. It's all right. You guys knew this was going to be a long video, right? The Ultim version weighs 3.88 ounces, which is actually pretty impressive. I'm going to guess that the titanium one weighs at least 4.75, almost 5 ounces. Nope, it's less, 4.9 ounces. Not bad for full titanium because it's essentially titanium with another piece of titanium on it. I mean, that's what you're looking at here. So, yeah. It is plenty comfortable, though. It's just so much more comfortable than you would imagine. It's so weird that the curvature of this, it's not just to complete this angular look. There's purpose behind it. It really does work. <laughs> I, uh, I'm fighting the urge as much, as rare as I know this is going to be. Because listen, guys, here's the destiny of this. If the base, if the entry level price of $1,000 bothers you, uh, and you're just like, I would never, well, then you should give up on this model. Because the inevitable fate of this, and this isn't guesswork, this is... You know, at this point, I'm 15 years into the hobby, and I've been well aware of Hawk and Surge for a long time. I've seen what these things do. The inevitable end result of this is massive secondary market prices, and there is no way around it. If, if you can't handle $1,000, well, after these become completely and totally unavailable, I mean, you can already check secondary right now. These rooks will go for substantially more, and as time progresses, that price will just continue to go up. Don't like it? Too bad. That's the way that it is, right? So um, if you want one of these, this time period where they're being made is your best chance at paying anything close to reasonable, right? And what, right now, I think the way that he has these price is reasonable. I think $1,000 entry level is, is fine for me. Um, you know, and I think most people who are interested in stuff like this will say the same. Not everybody. If you're not a knife enthusiast, obviously that's way too much money. If your view of a knife is purely utilitarian and you can't imagine a world where there are any elements on the knife that anybody, you know, any type of enthusiast could appreciate beyond function, I don't know why you're watching this channel, right? But <laughs> I've got 3,600 other uploads with the same mentality as the foundation, right? That it, it exists. This world exists, right? So that's, that's where we're at there. Um, but, um, yeah, the edges of everything, incredibly well knocked down. I mean, this is uh, a knife in this territory. Every last edge is going to be well paid attention to. Uh, anything that looks simple, anything that looks like an afterthought, let me tell you, it isn't. He has really made sure that every last, I think it's better exemplified by the Ultim version because you can really see the care that was taken with every edge, the precision that was taken with every edge, right? Uh, all the internals, it's not just that, but just how all the lines meet up and how you know, any parts that are meant to interact with other parts, it's just a perfect interaction. It's a it's a perfect transition, right, from the edges of um, the beveled uh, liners up to the scale, right, and how that shadow boxed all the way around. It's just really, really nice. You can see the additional screws underneath here, which actually look like their T8, which is nice. Um, I'm happy to see that underneath there. They're definitely larger than the T6 screws. So why the stamped out pocket clip, right? He told me, he said, I could have easily done a milled clip. But he said, I got to be honest with you, I hate them. I don't like milled clips. I think that the stamp clips and the swoop, he does have the swoop exactly the way that I always say, right? The swoop I always talk about is the one on the Spyderco Para 3 MXG deep carry clip, right? You can see here, wide, rounded, shallow swoop. Same thing. He's got it exactly right. So I think he has the same types of preference as me when it comes to function in and out of the pocket, and that's really, really great. But he does not like milled clips. You know, and it's, he could have done it. But that I, again, that would have been a – while while that certainly makes a difference when we're talking about a knife that's like a $75 knife doing a milled titanium clip is like, wow, value, right? On this, while a lot of people might have expected it, it does come down to the preferences of the maker. And at this, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not like he was trying to cut any corners here. This is his, his preference, right? And this is a custom knife and he's creating it. I imagine as many custom knives are created as a passion project, right? So, um, this is, it comes down to preference. Would have been nice to see a lefty, you know, um, mounting position for the clip, but we don't have one here. Um, I think this, would have worked fine. Yeah. In fact, you can 
you can manipulate it pretty easily. So it would have been really cool to have an additional. It's possible that he will mill. Um, I don't know this. You might be able to ask him if you have an order, if you by some chance are able to order one of these. You might be able to ask him, you know, can you mill another hole there so I can mount it for, for lefty carry? I doubt he'll reverse the lock, but you can still manipulate it, right? In and out of the pocket, this thing is a breeze because the pocket clip is designed well despite just being a, you know, plain stamped clip. Carry depth, about medium. It works, right? Um, the stop, like you can see, it's external. Uh, it's plenty of surface contact there to lock the blade out. Blade plate, no. Are we kidding? Come on, this is a hawk. A hawk uh, lock and a surge creation, right? It's not going <laughs> to... Neither of them have any blade play at all. No stick, no pivot lash. Incredibly smooth. Oh my God, look at this. <laughs> it's just so unbelievably smooth. And the detent, what's acting as the detent, the toggle detent, is probably the single most satisfying click into the close position ever. Oh, God, that's good. Centering, you bet it's perfect. Same thing on both of them. They are both absolutely perfect. These are some of the most unique creations that I have ever handled on this channel. Um, they are cool. They are functional, right? They're expensive. They're collector's pieces, you know, that are destined to go up in value. This is a, you know, this is kind of a holy grail um, sort of culmination of things for a lot of people. Now, if you just if you look at this and you're like. I think it's ugly and it's way too expensive, then that's fine. You know, there's going to be plenty of people thinking that. But for me, this is something special. This is something cool. And I am a huge fan of this. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and recommend that you go out and buy a $1,000 pocket knife. But for people who have made the journey up to this point, right? And you're like, this is interesting. Is this Surge fellow? You know, is he a... Is he a does he make good knives? <laughs> are these these hot guys? Are they uh you know are they are they are they worth anything? Yeah, <laughs> this is one of those things that if you've made the journey up to this point, you 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 probably want something like this in your collection, right? So specifically for those people, or for people who are plenty familiar with Surge and Hawk, or just Surge or just Hawk, yes, for sure, for sure, go out of your way, hunt it, right? This is the kind of stuff that knife enthusiasts live for. For everybody else, this is fun eye candy, right? And that's perfectly fine. There's no, you know, if, if that's the way you enjoy this stuff, just watching it or living vicariously through my channel, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but these are really cool. These will probably make it into the final video for 2023 as like the best of something or other, you know, might be like my, uh, I might have to create an award for it. <laughs> most unique, most interesting lock or something like that. But yeah, definitely one of the coolest things that I've seen this year. And ever. So this is going to go on my favorite knives of all time playlist. I'm not going to put it on any recommended because it's, it's a custom knife. It's rare. It's expensive, right? But it is going to go on my favorite knives of all time because it absolutely is. Thanks again to Serge for sending this in. Thanks to Levon for letting me uh, use yours for the video. That's going to be pretty much it today, guys. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.